showtime now because um, we have Paula, who's going to speak to us. Um, I, I think you all know who Paula is. She's been a very welcome guest at the previous uh, Evening War conference. Um, and I suspect many of you have read her uh, excellent book, Mad World. Um, I think that this, in terms of Evelyn War literature and biography, was actually a very important book, uh, funnily enough, as for those only dealt with a small episode or a small focus in his life. Um, it, it opened up this sense of Evelyn War as uh, someone who just wasn't a, 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 a catalogue of eccentricities and abuses and rudenesses. And it gave an insight to what it might be like actually being a personal friend of Evelyn War's and, and I think that's, in many ways, it's been a bit of a, of a game changer. And I think that we, we're now in a, in a new generation of people who are, who are looking at war as, as, as a fascinating, complicated person, uh, but someone who was loved and was lovable, despite all his uh, grotesqueries. Um, and that makes him more interesting and more compelling to read. And I think Paula had a big, a big um, foot in that movement, and I, did, and I hope it carries on. Anyway, today, um, Paula is going to talk to us about Kit Kennedy, and I don't think it's a subject that many of us know that much about. She will explain who Kit Kennedy was and her connection um, to Evelyn Wall, which I, I think has been rather overlooked. So, hooray. Paula Byrne, here we go. Hooray. Thank you. Just... Thank you very, very quickly. Thank you, Dani Alexander, for that lovely introduction. I'm not worthy of it, but it's very, very appreciated. And thank you to Barbara and to Martin. And um, thank you all for having me. I'm absolutely delighted to be here. That I was reminding um, some of my friends from America last night, the last time I gave a talk at an Even War conference, do you remember I was on a coach? Yes. I was on the bus. <laughs> there, was a, there was a great sort of wavy mishap. <laughs> which meant that I, my talk had to, it was, it, I, I couldn't do it. So I said, well, just do it on the bus, for God's sake, on the way to Coon Flory. So I was thinking, <laughs> <laughs> do, do you remember? Yeah, some of you were here. And I'd say, yes, the biggest. And then this happened in 1920. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very pleased to be back and, and not on a bus. I'm really, really pleased to be here. Um, and uh, so without further ado, um, I thought I'd give you some light relief as well, because you've all been working very hard. So I thought it's not... It's going to be about kick and a little bit about even more, but it won't be that much about even more. So apologies for that. And um, there aren't that many jokes, which is you're going to be very cross about. But there are some jokes, um, but to, some of it's quite sad. Um, so I'll, I'll, without further ado, move on. Can I stand? I don't want to sit. Yeah, no, it's not. Okay. Um, so the talk is called uh, "Partial Lives, Obscure Lives," um, and um, I'll, I'll talk a bit more, a bit about my own sort of biographical journey and, uh, and, and partial life, um, which is how this sort of all began with uh, even more. Um, so, but you're going to have to get some nice pickies as well. So 1952 got off to a bad start for even more. Very nervous. In January, his agent, A.D. Peters, had driven to Piers Court to give him a good talking to about his taxes. Peters advised him to retrench, to cut expenditure to £4,000 a year. War listened very politely, deflected the issue, and quietly paid Peter's uh, hotel bill and expenses. He wrote to Nancy Mitford uh, to tell her that he was hopelessly ruined financially, not morally. He was depressed. He'd quarrelled with most of his friends. Later, he said, one makes friends up to one's 30s, quarrels with them between 45 and 55, and makes new ones in the 60s. Between 45 and 55 is an irritable time. In middle age, one thinks of the young with distaste as a poor imitation of oneself. When one is older, one realises that they're quite different people and they become interesting. To Graham Greene, he wrote, I am just completing my 49th year. It has been a year of lost friends for me, not by death, but by were and ter. Our friendship started rather late. Pray God it lasts. In my partial life biography of Even War, Mad World, I argue that friendship was deeply important to Even War. He described his Oxford years as essentially a catalogue of friendships. Later, when he moved from Oxford to London, he befriended a group of women, which included Lady Diana Cooper, Lady Mary and Lady Dorothy Ligon, he liked his ladies, and uh, the Honourable Diana Mitford. With the exception of Diana Mitford, Lady Mosley, the rest became friends for life. So I'm just going to give you some nice pics. 
Diana Mitford was the first in a long line of devoted, beautiful, intelligent female friends that fell under Evelyn Waugh's spell as he fell under theirs. Physically, she was a female version of the ethereal blonde man he'd fallen for in his youth, Hugh Ligon, um, and the forerunner of the three women he idolised throughout his life, um, Mamie Ligon, Diana Manners, and his second wife, uh, Laura Herbert. Like all of these women, Diana Mitford, who had recently married the heir to the Guinness fortune, Brian Guinness, was aristocratic, blonde and fragile looking, but with a steely inner strength. She was just 19 and pregnant with her first child. Um, Diana and War were barely apart for the best part of 1929, but after she had her baby, the friendship petered out, ended. Uh, Diana, of course, left her first husband for Oswald Oswald Mosley, leader of the British Union fascists, and for three years she was interned in Holloway Prison. Whilst she was at prison, War sent her a copy of his uh, his novel work, Suspended. His pregnant heroine, Lucy Simmons, was partly based on Diana, and that lovely and beautiful phrase, isn't her beauty, rang through the room like a peal of bells, as he describes uh, Lucy. One of the last letters War wrote was to Diana... Mosley. She had written to him asking why war had severed the friendship, and he wrote back, pure jealousy. You and Brian were immensely kind to me at a time when I greatly needed kindness after my desertion by my first wife. I was infatuated with you. Not, of course, that I aspired to your bed, but I wanted you to myself as a special friend and confidant. War lost Diana, but he gained the friendship of the Ligon sisters, who became close friends in 1931. They were the girls who, who had inspired one of his most celebrated scenes in Vile Bodies, uh, the gate-crashing debacle of 10 Downing Street, when Agatha turns up in her pyjamas. Um, that was based on, on, on a story um, that the Ligon sisters had also done that, which is in my book, so I won't talk too much about that. Uh, but his closest friendship... Uh, was with uh, Lady Mary, known as Mamie, to her friends. Oh, I got that right. Um, there she is, beautiful. Um, he called her Blondie, she called him Beau. Um, and I argue in Mad World that she, Judith Flight, sort of part based on her. War wrote Black Mischief at their ancestral home, uh, Madrasville Court in Great Malvern. The house was the model for Hetton Abbey in a handful of dust. War adored Mad, as they call the house Madrasfield, and for many years it became um, a second home for him. He used the glamorous Ligon sisters as models for his line drawings in uh, Black Mischief, and he dedicated the book to Mary and Dorothy. Mamie was one of his models for Julia Flight, her beauty, her glamour, her spidery body, her flapper slang. Lady Julia, like Lady Mary, had a face of floor, flawless Florentine quattrocento beauty, but with an air of Renaissance tragedy. And in my book, I talk about the great sort of family scandal um, that was an inherited stain on her brightness, as with, with Julia. But again, I'm, I'm not going to go into that now, because you probably you can read it. Uh, But in 1952, (laughs) War felt he was losing his friends. Mamie, beautiful Mamie, was living in near poverty, was selling her jewellery to make ends meet, and it descended into a cloud of alcoholism. He informed Nancy Mitford that Mamie and her husband were following the old abeyant custom of residing together without speaking, difficult without servants. He (laughs) felt that Mamie was lost to him as he abhorred her husband. Um, In April... That year, 1952, he travelled to France (coughs) with Diana Cooper. She picked him up in Nice and and drove him to Paris. Diana thought the trip a great success. I'll hold tightly to my heart the cheer of your pink smile and pink carnation on the Nice platform. Dearest Wu, Harold Acton says you're mad. I agree, but I like it that way. He wrote back, I was sad to leave you in your famous fur coat, full of good wine as I was, I was sad our treat was over. Such a treat to me, who takes my few pleasures so sadly and doomed to disappoint those I love. May your shells never lack pearls. I love that. (laughs) That same month, he quarrelled with Nancy over her love of France, and she retorted, what rubbish. Is England the England of Shakespeare? Is Germany the Germany of Goethe? You are not very accurate in all your statements. Then, in September, War heard that his other friend, Roman Catholic, Clarissa Eden, um, uh, Clarissa Churchill, Winston's niece, had married, divorced Protestant Anthony Eden. He was deeply upset. Clarissa's 
apostasy, I can never say that word, did I say it right? Yes, you did. Okay. <laughs> has upset me more than anything that has happened since Kick's death. I can't write about it or think of anything else. Memories came flooding back of War's beloved friend Kick and the part he felt he'd played in her tragedy. So who was Kick? She was the one friend I missed in this book about friendship. I miss Kit Kennedy. Um, she's the subject of my book that I've just finished, and so I'll be talking a bit about uh, War and Kick. So, but I just want to pause for just a moment before I go on to Kick uh, to consider the place of uh, literary biography in the 21st century. And it's in the, the talks called Partial Lives, Obscure Lives. And I do think biography is at a really interesting and exciting time. Um, of course, when I wrote my book, my, my world book, I didn't want to write the cradle-to-grave um, biography, not least because Selena and Martin had done it so brilliantly. Why would I want to do that? I, and one could never replicate it, and one wouldn't want to. Um, but I wanted to write about even more, and I wanted to, to look at him through the prism of his friendships and the people he loved and the people who loved him. So I, I was always very clear about partial life. And quite interestingly, at the time, there was a bit of controversy about partial life. People saying we're not quite sure about partial life and what does, what, what's it all about. But it seems to me that lots of people um, are doing these things. In 1599, Jim Shapiro is a year in Shakespeare's life, for instance, is a good example. Um, I think The Ballad of Dorothy Wordsworth by Francis Wilson is one of the best books on Dorothy Wordsworth. And it, just start, it starts from the moment when Dorothy when William marries and Dorothy has this collapse and it sort of works backwards. It has this sort of wonderful moment and it just centres on the Grasmere journals. So partial life was, was very much what I wanted to do. And particularly because if you're right, my, my problem was I wanted to write about even one, I wanted to write about Jane Austen, but they've been done to death. And I wanted to find a fresh way of doing them. Um, one always wants new readers to come to great writers so I think the more people who do this sort of thing the better. Um, So for Jane Austen I knew that after even more I wanted to go back to Jane Austen. My first book was a book um, about um, Jane Austen in theatre and my my latest book was looking at the life of Jane Austen through objects. So each chapter starts with an object and then sort of uses the object as a portal into the world and it it felt to me like a, a nice way of interweaving the life and the works rather than as I say the sort of cradle to grave, um, uh, rather deadening march, womb to tomb. Um, And and I think with with, with big figures like War and Jane Austen, that's quite worthy. But I'm also quite interested in obscure lives and what I think of sort of footnote people, people who are just a footnote in somebody's life. Um, When I was writing my first book, I came across Mary Robinson, who was a contemporary of Jane Austen, knew nothing about her, um, and discovered that she was one of the most famous women. She was painted over 80 times in the 18th century. She was an actress, she was a feminist, she was a poet. Um, she gave her f- uh, break to these two young um, poet upstarts called William Wordsworth and um, Samuel Taylor Coleridge because she was poetry editor of the Morning Post. And she'd only ever been a footnote in their lives. It's, oh, Mary, oh, she was the one who gave them that break. So I set out to write about that obscure life, but, but I actually did do um, Cradle to Grave for that. Um, and then I just wanted to sh- um, share the, my, late, my very latest book, uh, Belle, um, because again, uh, I was approached by a film company to write a very quick biography of, of Belle, because I'd written about her in my Jane Austen book. Um, and I said, well, I've got a problem. And they said, what? I said, there are only eight known facts about I do Bell, and they said, "Oh, don't worry, you can find a way to do it." <laughs> so I said, "Well, it will be a challenge." So I, you know, I asked two sensible questions about should, should ask. One is, "How much are you going to pay me?" And two, "How long have I got?" And when both answers were satisfactory, I thought, "I'm going to do it." And um, so it's a real challenge um, in, uh, in trying to, to piece together a life where I say there are only eight known facts. It's sort of partial lives, obscure lives. Um, so kick. Who was Kit Kennedy? She was the fourth child of Joseph and Rose Kennedy, um, sister to future President Jack Kennedy. Uh, War first met Kick, she was always called Kick KK for her initials, um, when she resided in England in 1938 to 9, when her father was an um, American ambassador. So the family all came over and all the nine children were you know, photographed by the press and they lived in England. Um, she made her debut in 1938 in a fabulous party at the ambassadorial residence at Prince's Gate. Uh, she was presented at court um, and she quickly became uh, the most popular debutante. Um, that's just a, a picture of all the Kennedy children. Um, so I'll just quickly go through, actually. Cause, uh, so Joe, Joe Jr., Jack, 
Uh, Rosemary, who was, you remember, she uh, was mentally retarded and had a lobotomy. Her father arranged her to have a lobotomy, and then she was institutionalised for the rest of her life. Terribly sad story. Uh, my kick, uh, Eunice, Pat, Bobby, and Teddy. Um, and they all came to England, and that's when war um, met, met kick. And this is her being presented um, at court with Rose Kennedy, her, the mother in the middle, and Rosemary um, here on the right. Kick wowed English upper-class society with her all-American charm and vivacity. She was warm, honest, down-to-earth, irreverent. She was accepted into upper-class society on her own merits, which war, always the outsider, understood. Unlike her mother Rose, who was a social snob and was obsessed by English etiquette and decorum, Kick could not care less about such things. At country house parties, she would amuse her host by kicking off her shoes, throwing herself down on the antique sofa and calling people by nicknames. She shocked the Duke of Devonshire by calling him Dukey Wookie. <laughs> <laughs> she loved poking fun at English pretension. She had all the charm of a Henry James heroine. Debo Mitford, youngest of the Mitford girls, adored Kick and said, although not the most beautiful of girls, she was by far the most popular. And there's a lovely quote here about Debo talking about the Kennedys. Nothing like the Kennedy family had been seen before in the rarefied atmosphere of London diplomatic circles. For the next 17 months, they enlivened the scene. Vital, intelligent and outgoing, Kick was able to talk to anyone with ease, and her shining niceness somehow ruled out any jealousy. Suitors appeared instantly, but I noticed from the start that none of the girls was annoyed by her success, and I never heard a catty remark made behind her back. <coughs> Debo Mifford echoed many of her friends in finding it hard to define Kick's appeal. Her mother, in her biography, called it the X Factor. Uh, Jack had it too. The press called it the Kennedy charisma. War adored her from the start. Kick was not only rich, confident, funny, more importantly, she was a devout Roman Catholic and had what her mother described as the gift of faith. She had been educated at Sacred Hearts convents in America and France. Like the rest of the Kennedy clan, she rarely missed mass and prayed on her knees every night. It's true, isn't it? JFK, people said that when you went into the White House, he'd always... Uh, late at night he'd be on his knees praying he never lost that habit of praying on his knees Kick was a member of America's most famous Roman Catholic family her parents were on intimate terms with Pope Pius XII and they attended his coronation in 1939 he gave little Teddy his first Holy Communion Kick and War first met at a dinner in 1938 and War asked her what was the size of her dot Kick had no idea what he meant. She assumed he must have meant the size of her belly button. So she responded, she responded that she didn't think her dot was any larger than anybody else's dot. War replied, hers must be ample, as her father was in finance. <laughs> she finally realised, to her great amusement, that he was referring to her dowry. <laughs> War resumed the friendship when Kick returned uh, to war-torn England where she worked as a donut and coffee girl, a morale-boosting girl in the American Red Cross in Hans Crescent in Knightsbridge. Um, Kick was, uh, there's a lovely quote, uh, so the best in America has ever sent us, and there she is on her bike in Knightsbridge uh, in her Red Cross uniform. Um, so when war, when war broke out, uh, the ambassador, Kennedy, sent all the children back. He was terrified of them being bombed in the Blitz. So he stayed in England. In fact, Rosemary also, who was the a mentally incapacitated child stayed in England. The rest of the children were sent back. And Kick spent the first three years, of the, she was a journalist, but she spent uh, the first three years tr desperate to get back to London and to get back to her friends. Um, and she finally came back in 1943. Uh, even more resumed the friendship when she returned to, 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 uh, to, to England. Kick was expected to make a good marriage, as her friends called it, but she shocked her Catholic friends like, like war and deeply upset her mother when she fell in love with a prominent Anglican, William Cavendish, Lord Hartington, and heir uh, to Chatsworth. Kick met Billy in 1938 at the Queen's annual summer garden party at Buckingham Palace. They dated for months, and then the relationship was broken off when Kick returned to America um, at the outset of the war. So, despite the protestations of her family, Kick returned to England in 1943 and began seeing Billy again when he was home on leave. 
He was now a captain in the Guards and was also making plans to stand for Parliament. Kick, who had politics running through her veins, was delighted. She accompanied him on the campaign trail under the guise of being a village girl called Rosemary Tonks. Did her best to disguise her Amer- American accent. There's a lot of anti-Joe feeling, of course, because of it, 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 thinking that he was uh, appease, appeasing Hitler. Um, so he became incredibly unpopular, and Kick was very, very worried about how she would be received when she came back to England because of because of Joe Joe's position. Um, but in fact, everybody embraced her, and and, and, and she was taken up again. Uh, she wrote long letters to her family, telling them of her excitement at canvassing for votes for Billy. She was closest to her brother, Jack Kennedy, and she wrote to him, revealing an insurmountable barrier to her relationship with Billy. I know he will never give in about the religion, and he knows I never would. It's all rather difficult, as he is very, very fond of me, and as long as I'm about, Billy will never marry. Having for once revealed her deepest feelings and concerns, she re- reverts back to her usual jocular tone. Um, the Kennedys, you know, they're always joke. They, they find it very hard to... Um, it's been brilliant writing this book. They find it very hard to sort of show their emotions, and it's all jokes and teasers. And, and then she writes this to Jack, which is lovely. It's really too bad, because I'm sure I would have been a most efficient Duchess of De- Devonshire in the post-war world. And as I'd have a castle in Ireland, one in Scotland, one in Yorkshire, and one in Sussex, I could keep my old nautical brothers in their old age. <laughs> Her letters are charming. Uh, Billy was quite determined that despite the religious differences, Kick was the only one he would ever marry. In the months leading up to their engagement, Kick was deeply troubled by the fact that she had to relinquish her religion in order to marry him. Kick's father, Joe, was supportive, but Rose, the Catholic matriarch, was furious. Um, I'm going to just nip to Rose and I'll go back to Darcy. Um, Rose remarked, to put it mildly, there was little in the family backgrounds to encourage a romance between Billy and Kick. Rose made the rather sly point that Billy's father was a Freemason, under condemnation by the Catholic Church for more than two centuries. Um, so her, her memoir is very, very sort of interesting about the, about the, 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 the scandal, as it was called. What Rose did not fully understand was her daughter's utter anguish at her position. A friend remembered the sight of Kick on her knees, praying for 15 minutes, lost in prayer. In the morning, she would pray again, and off she would go to Farm Street uh, to Mass in Mayfair. Both parents were involved in this struggle, but also Archbishop Spellman, Enrico Galazzi, and the Pope. Everyone was trying to find a way through. Kick wrote to her family to tell them that the Duke of Devonshire had given her a lovely old leather book for her 24th birthday in February 1944. The Duchess insisted that she had nothing to do with this present, and when Kick opened it, she saw it was a book of common prayer. She laughed and she thanked him, but she knew what this symbolic present meant. The Duchess and Kick had a long talk about this situation, and Billy's mother said, it's a shame because you're so good and it would please everyone so much. The Duchess longed to make things easy. This is Kick's letter. She begged her parents, please try and discover loopholes, although I keep feeling that the particular parties involved would make any compromise impossible. The Catholics would say it would give scandal. The situation, Daddy, is a stickler. Kick always saw her father could find a way. She turned to him whenever she had a problem and he sought to to help. The plan then was to get a special dispensation. One possible solution was that any daughters born to Billy and Kick could be raised as Catholics and the sons raised as Protestants. The argument went back and forth, back and forth to no avail. The Kennedy family had a code name for the situation, Agnes and Harty. Agnes was Kick's middle name and Harty was for Lord Hartington. Um, Rose wrote to her daughter in late February, there is no news about Agnes and Harty. Frankly, I do not see that Dad can do anything. It did not matter to Rose that her daughter was in love with one of the most prominent and eligible bachelors in England. His wealth, social status, family history meant nothing in the face of her religion. When both people have been handed something all their lives, how ironic it is that they, that they can't have what they most want, is what Rose said. Rose recalled in her memoir that there were many transatlantic telephone calls, letters and cables. There was enough material, said Rose, for a novel. As she said, it would have been a marriage made in heaven except for the special and ironic circumstances of religious loyalties. Kick, during this period, went frequently to church, um, taking Holy Communion whenever she could, almost as if she was making the most of taking Holy Communion whilst she could, because, of course, the minute she married Billy, she would have been unable to receive Holy Communion. Um, and it really mattered to her. 
A rose wrote to say, do not be exhausting yourself and running your little legs off going to church as your first duty is to your job in the Red Cross. We had a letter from someone in Boston whose third cousin watches you and commu- go to communion and frequently. I love this. Third cousin in Boston spotting kid going to mass and writing to Rose. Um, so the news has been carried across the water. Jo, her father, said it was her and Billy's decision and all the rest could go jump in the lake. Whilst her father was sending messages of support, Rose had a more powerful strategy, intimating that her daughter would ultimately do the right thing and not marry Billy. I understand perfectly the terrific responsibilities and disappointment of it all. She later deeply regretted that Jo had not gone back to London to talk kick after the marriage. Jo had gone back to London by then, her father. Kick turned to Evelyn Wall for help, who suggested that she take advice from the man who had converted him, Father Darcy, blue chin, fine, slippery mind. Um, he was the priest of Farm Street Church in Mayfair, Darcy was absolutely unrelenting. I mean, it's heartbreaking, I mean, the, the, the letters, as he painted a very bleak picture of a godless life for Kick if she relinquished her faith to marry Billy. Marriage to Billy was living in sin. In the eyes of the Catholic Church, she would have been unable to take Holy Communion, unable to make an act of confession. She would not go to heaven, said Darcy, and nor would her children. In her friend even Moore's uh, Catholic novel, Brideshead, uh, the beautiful aristocrat Catholic Julia Flight is faced with Kick's dilemma when she falls in love with a divorced um, Anglican. War was writing the novel at this time, um, and there's a scene when the heroine, when Julia, visits a priest from Farm Street to talk about her problem. Not in the confessional, but in a dark little parlour kept for such interviews. And this is, Kick keeps going back to this dark little parlour um, to talk to, to, to Darcy about what, what, what can they do. Um, War was clear, clearly drawing on Kick's experience. She barely listened to this Julia Flight. She barely listened to him. He was refusing her what she wanted, and that was all she needed to know. Um, Kick felt isolated by her Catholicism. In Brideshead, even War brilliantly captures the sense of difference and otherness that Catholics sometimes feel. When the hero Charles, who eventually, of course, converts to Roman Catholicism, says that Catholics seem just like other people, he is rebuked by Sebastian. My dear Charles, that's exactly what they're not. They've got an entirely different outlook on life. Everything they think is important is different from other people. And I think he does really capture that brilliantly, that, 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 that sense of otherness. Kick wrote to her parents the Duke was very worried about having a Roman Catholic in the family. In their eyes, the most awful thing that could happen to our son would for it to to become a Roman. With me in the family, that danger becomes immediate, even though I would promise that the child could be brought up as an Anglican. Perhaps what Kick was really preparing her parents for was the idea that she was more than likely to be married in a registry office. For a Roman Catholic, this was the greatest of disappointments. Kick refused to have an Anglican, Anglican ceremony. She could have had, she could have converted to Anglican and had an Anglican ceremony in, 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 in a church, but she wouldn't do it. She would not convert. So this was the compromised position. Not a Roman Catholic church, but not the beautiful English church that Billy's ancestors had been married in. It was sad and disappointing and grim, but wartime compromises seemed to be not so terrible. She told her parents the church would not marry us and the result would be that I would be married in a registry office. I can continue to go to church, to Catholic church, but I can't go to communion. Her anguish was clear. Um, By April 1944, she had made up her mind. She wrote to her dearest family. She talked of Billy and how he was in tremendous spirits and not at all gloomy about the future. And then she dropped her bombshell. I've definitely decided to marry him. And then moved on. You do understand the ceremony would have to be performed in a registry office, which is rather sordid. But it's the only thing I can do, as I won't have an Anglican service. Rose Kennedy was shocked and distraught. In normal circumstances, she was always punct- uh, scrupulous about punctuation and grammar, writing in perfectly lucid uh, sentences. Her anguish is clear at this time. She wrote down her feelings in, in a diary in a haphazard, broken stream of consciousness that she called Notes on My Reaction to Kick's Marriage. K sent Cable Saturday, April 29th, that she would marry in a registry office. Joe phoned me, said he hadn't slept. Naturally, I'm disturbed, horrified, heartbroken, talked for a minute on our responsibility and allowing her to drift into this dilemma, then decided we should think of practical ways to extricate her. 
I said I would think it out. I called him later. I mean, she's really going bonkers. Um, Billy wrote a beautiful letter to Rose apologising for not written before. He'd never met her properly. I have loved Kick for a long time, but I did try so hard to face the fact that the religious difficulties seemed insurmountable, and I tried to make up my mind that I should have to make do with second best. I felt, too, if Kick could find someone else she could be really happy with, it would be much better and more satisfactory for her. But then he explained by Christmas he'd made up his mind to propose. I couldn't bear to let her go without ever asking her if we couldn't find a way out. He told Rose he knew he was going back out to fight and time was getting short. He told Rose, I could not believe that God could really intend two loving people, both of whom wanted to do the right thing and both of whom were Christians, to miss the opportunity of being happy and perhaps even useful together because of the religious squabbles of his human servants several hundred years ago. Rose would not have warmed to this. For her, Roman Catholicism was the only true religion. And for her, religion was never about men, but about God. Billy also explained his strong feelings about the religious upbringing of the children. He told Rose the reason he wanted his children to be raised as Anglicans was bound up with the National Church of England, as England was not a Roman Catholic country, and as he felt he benefited from so many of the advantages of the position, he felt he felt he, felt he should be setting a bad example um, if he gave in and allowed the children to be raised as Catholics. Billy thanked Rose for her consent, which she had not given, <laughs> told her he felt punch drunk after the emotional battering of the last few months, and told her of his amazing good fortune in being allowed to have Kick as my wife. It all seems incredibly wonderful. Billy ap- Billy apologised for what might seem a tyrannical attitude and closed by saying, I promise that both Kick and I have only done what we really believed in our hearts to be right. Kathleen Kennedy married the Marquis of Hartington at Chelsea Registry Office on the morning of Saturday, May the 6th, 1944. The event took no more than ten minutes. So so here's Kick looking so painfully thin and Billy... uh, Duchess of Devonshire, Duke of Devonshire, and the only member of the Kennedy family was Joe, who was um, uh, in the war, uh, fighting in the war, um, so he was the only one, and um, th- nobody else came to the wedding. Oh, Charles, what a squalid wedding. Those are the words of the beautiful young Catholic heroine of Brighthead, whose mixed marriage to an Anglican prevents her from being married in an ancient, beautiful cathedral as befitting her status. Squalid is the word the kick used to describe her own wedding in a registry office. In the days after the wedding, she told her mother, let us continue to pour in from irate Catholics, saying, I've sold my soul for a title. Billy is very busy answering them all. <laughs> On her daughter's wedding day, Rose dressed beautifully, immaculately as always, head to foot in black, checked herself into hospital um, to recuperate from her shock. She refused to give an interview, saying only to reporters, I'm sorry, but I don't feel physically well enough to grant an interview. I'm sorry it has to be this way. Jack Kennedy was unimpressed by his mother's antics. He thought it was a coup for his little sister to marry into such a family and bag England's most eligible bachelor. Jack wrote to his best friend, Len Billings, who had been in love with Kick for years, Your plaintive howl at not being let in on Kathleen's nuptials reached me this morning. You might as well take it in your stride. Um, And and as Sister Eunice from the depths of her Catholic wrath so truly said, it's a horrible thing, but it would be nice visiting her after the war, so we might as well face it. Jack added, with his usual wit, our family dinners at the Cape, when you don't pass Hartington the muffins, we'll all know how you feel. Meanwhile, with no word at all from Rose and Kick, Uh, Joe, Kick's eldest brother, young Joe, here, sent a cable to his parents. The power of silence is great. So Kick's writing all of these letters saying, please, please forgive me, and nothing. They're just not responding to it at all. And then Joe sends this telegram. Joe then wrote a fuller letter to Rose and to his parents. Billy is crazy about Kick. And I know they are very much in love. Somehow I think things will work out okay. It doesn't look so now, but I'm sure something will happen. This didn't influence me on my, any advice I gave. They started blaming Joe and saying, it's your fault, you advised her to marry him. And he says, as far as Kick's soul is concerned, I wish I had half her chance of seeing the pearly gates. As far as what people will say, the hell with them. I think we can all take it. It will be hardest on mother. And I do know how you feel, mother, but I do think it will be all right. From what I've seen, Kick handled herself like a champion. Even war was devastated. 
In May 1944, he wrote to Laura that he was hard at work on his magnus, uh, magnum opus, Brighthead, and wrote about the scandal. Kick Kennedy's apostasy. I'm doing it right, aren't I? Um, it's a sad thing. Her heathen friends have persuaded her that it's purely an English law that her children should be brought up as Catholic and that she can get married in the USA after the war. It is second front nerves that has driven her to this grave sin, and I am sorry for the girl. So Evelyn was really, really devastated. Billy, in the meantime, rejoined the Guards Armoured Division and landed in Normandy at the end of June. One of the privileges of Billy's position as a company commanding officer was that he was allowed to wear non-regulation clothing. He deliberately chose pale coloured white cord trousers and a bright white Macintosh. He refused always to wear a protective helmet. Um, It was a symbolic and courageous gesture to his men that he wasn't afraid to be taken down by a sniper. Everyone knew that uh, Germans targeted officers who could be recognised by their clothing. Um, He must have made quite a sight, this tall, handsome uh, major. I mean, six foot four, he was a tall man. And so you can imagine brightly dressed. Who's the character who dresses... Is there a character who dresses in white deliberately in in the Sword of Honor trilogy? Am I misremembering? No, Evelyn Ward did. He did. Yes. Evelyn did. Of course he did. Yes. I, of course he did. He threw his coat down. And I didn't Randolph go mad. R- R- Randolph, Randolph went bonkers with him, didn't he? I apologise later for being rude. And was it. it wasn't your rudeness I minded so much as your cowardice. Yeah, that was it. And I, I, I just remember this thing, wearing white, and, and right. I'm sure Evelyn did that too. Uh, Billy also insisted on carrying a fold of table and chairs. He insisted on manners in the field. He was, he was, he was marvellous. Um, when they set up camp, he would scan the field, Billy, and say, Now, where is the company office going to be? Ah, oh, we'll have it here, he would say, pointing at a little piece of grubby land. And then he'd set up his table and uh, get, get his linen out and, uh, uh, in, in, and his fine silver. Um, his men were devoted to him. Not so more than his Batman, um, Ingalls. The men loved to hear Billy shout, Ingalls, some water for my feet! And he'd run up with his, and wash his feet. Um, on an unusually calm morning in August, Billy wrote to Kick from France. I've been spending a lovely hour on the ground and thinking in a nice, vague, sleepy way about you and what a lot, uh, what a lot to look forward to if I come through this all right. I feel I may talk about it for the moment as I'm not in any danger, so I'll just say that if anything should happen to me, I shall be wanting you to try and isolate our life together, to face its finish and to start a new one as soon as you feel you can. I hope that you will marry again quite soon, someone good and nice. One of his platoon commanders recalled that Billy rarely mentioned Kick. He kept his feelings private except for one instant when he let out his feelings about the bad press Kick had received about abandoning her faith and marrying in a registry office. In early September, they moved rapidly eastward and liberated Brussels. After the jubilation of these days, the mood changed on September the 8th as the Germans fought back. Billy lost a quarter of his men in attempting to capture the village of Bevelo during the fierce battle, uh, but showed enormous courage and fortitude, walking across one of his sections as calmly uh, as if he'd been in the garden at Compton Place. He stood on the back of a tank, all six foot four of him, directing fire onto German tanks. All the time he was under fire. A fellow soldier wrote, Many of our guardsmen asked me, Who was this officer from the 5th Battalion? For it was impossible not to be inspired by his presence. The next day, his unit set out to capture the German-occupied town of Heppen, near Limburg. Major Cavendish Lord Hartington walked out ahead of his soldiers. Come on, you fellows, buck up, he said. He was wearing his white coat and his bright trousers. He was not wearing his helmet. There was fierce fighting and the British losses were great. Six tanks were left behind on the battlefield. The third company, led by Billy, attacked across an open field. A young boy, the son of a local farmer heard the sound of heavy shooting and realised that the battle for Heppen had begun. Billy left his tank outside the farmhouse belonging to the little boy Franz's father. Major Cavendish attacked our farmhouse in the rear and threw a hand grenade through the window knowing the Germans were inside. Later that day, when the fighting was over, the farm and his son returned to the scene of the battle. The place was deserted, except uh, a couple of neighbours who were living on the outskirts, and uh, a priest was hiding in his church. Franz and his father returned to the farmhouse at 3pm. What they saw was a scene of carnage. They found 11 English, 
30 German corpses. This is all entirely new information, by the way. There's nobody knows. This is, this is an eyewitness account. It's, it's really fantastic. Uh, there were three British dead soldiers, two Germans lying dead in front of the house. Inside, we saw how ferocious the battle had been. Franz saw two bodies lying next to one another. Two soldiers strangled each other to death. Some had bayonets in their bodies. Some even had spades in their bodies. It had been a hand-to-hand battle, eye-to-eye. Returning to the kitchen, they found two bodies of British soldiers. One of them was an officer, as his uniform was quite different from the rest of the soldiers. Franz recalls he was wearing bright trousers, a bright white Macintosh, and no beret or helmet. He was lying on his back with his feet against the back door of the kitchen door. No blood, no scar was on his face. Lord Hartington had been shot through the heart. Kick was devastated. In her diary on September 20th, she wrote, So ends the story of Billy and Kick. And that was the story behind Evelyn Waugh's remark in 1952, that Clarissa's marriage has upset me more than anything that has happened since Kick's death. I can't write about it. I can't think of anything else. War with Kick, much on his mind, wrote to Clarissa, urging her to persuade Eden to seek an annulment. Clarissa wrote back kindly, thanking him, but firmly saying he would never consent to this. War continued writing back, saying he disliked love affairs with a religious flavour. I am haunted by the memory, I'm nearly finished, um, of another not very distant tragedy, said War, when I did give advice, disastrously, An American Catholic girl married outside of the church because she was in love with a man under orders for the front. It caused great scandal. Then she was widowed, repented, and was received back. She asked me what she should have done, and I said, if you want to commit adultery or fornication and can't resist, do it. But realise what you are doing, and don't give the final insult of apostasy. Well, the girl followed my advice. And she was killed, eloping. So my advice isn't, wasn't, very much help. As I argue in Mad World, there is nothing that Evelyn War would not do to save the soul of one of his friends. After Billy's death, Kick did indeed return to the Catholic Church. She stayed in London, um, fell in love with Lord Milton, Peter Fitzwilliam, a dandy officer whom War had known in the commandos. Um, Peter was not only Anglican, He was married with a small daughter. He planned to divorce and marry Kick. They were killed in an air disaster. Uh, She was just 28. The girl followed my advice and was killed eloping. Actually, she wasn't eloping. She was taking her lover to meet her father in the hope that he would accept the relationship. For Rose Kennedy, it was God pointing his finger and saying no. War, by contrast, did not pass judgment. He simply blamed himself. The only Kennedy to attend uh, Kick's funeral was her father. That's a quick one, Peter Fitzwilliam. But hundreds of people attended the full mass for Kick in Farm Street and then took the train to Chatsworth, where she was buried. Even War was one of the mourners. Thank you very much. Very moving uh, account. Uh, we're, all, we're, all, we're all in bloody tears now. Sorry, yes, I thought I've got some very cheerful this paper. Uh, it? There was some jokes. There was some jokes. down here. Um, can, you, can we arrange the buckets just to catch all out? <laughs> Have we got any Tupperware buckets to catch our tears? Um, very interesting talk. Very interesting to put that in perspective, and uh, I think very interesting as well because uh, times jolly well have changed, haven't they? Even even for Catholics and. Sometimes you look read Bright's head and you think, is it really possible that this great remonstrance went on over, mm-hmm. over whether someone was Catholic or not? Can they just get married and get on with it? It was very interesting to see that it really, really was a big issue, and particularly in exactly that society we're talking about. I love that um, Nancy Mitford letter. See, you remember this when Nancy says, uh, now, I, uh, now I believe in God, and I, and I tell him jokes, and she writes a letter just, and why doesn't God want people to be happy? So when she's discussing Brighton, and, and she says, and uh, Julia, do you remember? And she's talking, she says, do you, why can't Julian? And, and he said, and even my back says, um, well, God wants people to do the right thing. It's not that he doesn't want them to be happy. And there's yeah. this lovely sort of exchange, but you're absolutely right. I mean, it really was, you know, it, it, tore, it tore those families apart. And then he died anyway after all that. But, there uh, was a critic back in the late 50s, early 60s, who uh, said, you know, well, uh, Charles and Charles had just gotten an annulment, or maybe Julia too, 
And of course, the novel was being written in the war, and I wrote in the book that uh, it might have been a little bit difficult, considering the circumstances, uh, what was the Vatican surrounded by enemy <laughs> soldiers. And my, I had a really incompetent editor, the worst I'd ever had, uh, saying, you know, what, what would this have prevented? This. I said, well, in World War II, it was in all the papers. It's so true. I mean, she, she, and there's loads more to this story because the letters fire about, and she, she was convinced that she could get a, a dispensation from the Pope, and that, the, the, you know, the letters were going back and forth. But this thing about um, being a prominent Catholic family and the scandal, Rose was so obsessed by this because she said, we are the Kennedys, we set the example. And there was a real fear. I mean, I'm sort of torn, but, you know, Rose is a Lady Marchmain. It's very sort of tempting to see her as a Lady Marchmain figure, um, incredibly pious and very religious and very intransigent and all that. But actually, you know, she felt, she said, if Kit Kennedy is allowed to marry out to the church, everyone will do it. You know, that was a sort of fear that she would set a, a sort of dangerous precedent um, but they did try a dispensation. They tried to not. I mean, it just—it was just never going to happen because Billy would not relinquish. You know, it was—he it was, right. said it was a Romeo and Juliet thing, Billy, and said, you know, he was not prepared to relinquish. And it, it was a question of bringing the children up as as Anglicans, which is. And, and, and the thing is that Rose Kennedy was an Irish Catholic, Irish American Catholic, mm -hmm. and they were the very most, still are to a certain extent, the very most conservative. If, if you run across a bishop or a card, American bishop or cardinal with it. Uh, an Irish last name, uh, you can forget about any progressive. <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody else have questions or comments or anything really? When's the book out? <laughs> When's the book out? Ah, well, it, it's finished um, and I, I'm just doing a, a final polish. Um, and annoyingly, my husband's got a big bug of Ted Hughes coming out in October and they don't want us to come out with competing with one another. <laughs> so they're holding me back. So they're, they're probably going to hold it back until January. So which, it's a quite a nice time to be published, actually, January. Um, so yeah, it's out, it's out in January. But I love the way, I love when you're about it, like how you just, you see these footnotes and you say, who's that? And then all of a sudden you say, oh gosh, the stories have been told me. And it, it's sort of really intriguing. And as I said, I was cross that I'd missed kick. I hadn't really sort of, you know, just, you just hadn't sort of figured as somebody who I thought was, and I remember the letter about him being very upset about um, had, uh, being very upset about her death, um, but uh, so it's generally. It's frustrating from the Evelyn Moore perspective that we a don't have any um, correspondence mm -hmm. between them, uh, but b we can't quite place the the meetings when he gave this great advice to her, when they were, where where they. I mean, there's obviously a record of them. But one's presuming this is during the war in London somewhere. It's during the war, it is, and then well, after Billy had died, and then she started, she took up with Peter Fitzwilliam, which was a, 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 she was with him for sort of 18 months, and even became a, a firm friend then. She had, she lived in Smith Square, she had these literary salons, and so people like, uh, even when we come to suppers, and, and she would, right. really know, she, she would talk to him about the dilemma um, uh, about Peter Fitzwilliam, but he, we know that he went to Farm Street, but we just don't, but, but, you know, there's, there's yeah. very little we do, do we know. Um, I mean, I've gone through two, uh, uh, two thousand ma pages of manuscripts in the Kennedy Library, and haven't found anything. But all the letters are in uh, where? Are they uh, they're, no, no, they're in uh, the Kennedy Library in Boston. So she didn't really live at Chatsworth for any 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 amount of time. No, no. She she spent a lot of time at, 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 at the castle in Ireland. Uh, Liz, do you pronounce it Lismore? Lismore. Yeah. Lismore. Yeah. Um, she spent a lot, and even after uh, they were so good to her family, they really adored her. And even after Billy's death, the Devonshires continued to think of her as, as a daughter. And she had uh, access to Lismore for, for family parties. So the first time JFK came, came to Ireland was as her guest, and then he went off um, in search of his own ancestors, Kennedy ancestors. And she wasn't interested. She was having these great supper parties in the castle, having a lovely time. Um, and, and Kennedy went off and you know, went, went to this little village and sort of introduced herself. Oh, you're a Kennedy, and he, he was absolutely determined he was going to find his uh, Kennedy. Uh, but she was given full reign. But they, but none of them were in chat because it was a with, with the war anyway. And it, then it was Debo who did that amazing job of um, of, of, of moving into Chatsworth and and, and, and doing right, all the work. Yeah. And of course, and Deb, no, Debo's was very, very close. She left a great account of Kick. She absolutely. Sorry, that grave is where in Derbyshire. Uh, this is this is in Chatsworth. So, sorry, she said that she's 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 buried at Chatsworth. Um, and the only, and again, only mourner was her father. None of the family were there. Um, when JFK made his first presidential um, visit to Ireland, he made an unscheduled stop and visited the grave. 
Um, and, and that was the first thing he wanted to do was to. I mean, he was so close to Kick. Their friend. I mean, they were incredibly. Cl- Joe, Jack, and Kick were very, very close. And very sad that two of them were casualties of the war. Um, but she's married to Ch- Ch- Chatsworth. Joy she has given. Joy she has found. Um, and the Kennedys, as I said, they really did consider her um, one of the family. It's not an especially elaborate tomb, is it? For um, a, 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 I suppose because I mean, I imagine that the husband. Have you got a picture of the husband's tomb? Oh, Billy. Billy, I imagine it's, it's got statues names on it. And oh, his tomb, no, sorry. No. Um, no, uh, um, it, well, he, of course, he was buried in Alton, um, in, in, oh, in Belgium. Yeah, she visited his grave kick. She does he have in. a monument to Chatham? Um, yes, I think he does. I haven't seen it, but I, I'll, I don't know. Uh, but he was, obviously, he was buried in Alton, um, in Belgium. So, very sad story. Sad story. Sorry, Bob. I didn't mean to make you cry. <laughs> Anybody else? Well, very much. Um, oh, well, we got a quick question and clarification. The, um, oh, the approval for the marriage didn't come because of, it was because of the raising of children? Because there used to be, you know, there were mixed marriages all the time. But that, that was fine. So was it the children? Because uh, his family's insistence that the children be raised Anglican, was that it? Yeah. Because, okay. I mean, he just very much felt that because he, he had so many sort of wonderful privileges, you know, that it was very important. And also, he was religious. He was deeply religious. Um, and, and the absolute sticking point was because uh, she was, she wanted to carry on being a Catholic and going to Mass, and of course she could, but the big sacrifice was not being able to take Holy Communion, not being able to make an act of confession. Um, so they were the compromise. She absolutely would not convert. And so there was these long letters when uh, she writes to her family, she's, and the Duke saying, why can't you get from Anglicanism what you get from Catholicism? What is it? And she's right to say, it's just different. This, you know, being a Catholic is different. And she said, it doesn't work like that. The Duke was just being very kind and saying, well, you, know, you can still pray, you can still get there. She was like, no, 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 it's not. You know, uh, because she did, she was, she had a very deep faith. Uh, but it really, the sticking point was... Uh, the children, it was raising the children uh, as Anglicans. Uh, I heard you say something about Teddy Kennedy's first communion, and did the law have some connection with them? Um, and it, it was the Pope gave him this. Uh, so, it, again, this, it was the sense of them being a very prominent Catholic family. So, they, they were friends before he became Pope Pius, they were friends of, of um, the Pope before he was Pope. Um, and he, he made, you know, the, the, he but then when he was made Pope, the whole of the Kennedy family went to the coronation. And at that time, he gave Teddy his first Holy Communion. So it really was a sense that they were the, mo- the most prominent um, Irish Catholic family in America. And for, for their daughter, and she was whitewashed. The saddest thing about the story was, after her death, they all, they all closed ranks. They lied about the fact she was in a, a, with her lover. So they said the story was... Um, and it was very sad. They, they, they went to her flat to en- anything that belonged to Peter. They ransacked the house. They went to uh, went, Wentworth Woodhouse. Peter had an even bigger house than Billy. I mean, it, 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 it's, it's huge. It's the biggest, in England, it's the biggest yeah. house in England. And, it, and he retained a, a, blo- a part of it during the war. And all her stuff was in. They got all her stuff out. And they, the press release said, uh, coincidentally, um, uh, Kick was, she just hitched a lift at the last minute. So they, they lied about it, and they just whitewashed her. They almost never t- spoke about her. Rose particularly really, really took it badly. So she's a sort of lost Kennedy. She's a Kennedy that nobody really talks about, or, or because they, 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 and, and being you know, with a married man um, in an aeroplane, and you know, it, it, her father was devastated when he opened her suitcase because uh, there was contraception. <laughs> so they, 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 and so there was a, 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 a sort of flimsy uh, lingerie for conscious, and for a Catholic again, you know, that had rose moon was not, must not know she was sleeping with this man. They've been together for sort of 18 months. Um, another kind of lobotomy. Another kind of lobotomy, yeah, indeed. Um, but she, so she and Rosemary, who had the lobotomy, was, were the sort of daughters that nobody really uh, talked about. So it's a way of sort of telling, telling th- th- that story. Again, that was, I thought was, was Poor. appealing. Wasn't Joe Kennedy Sr. A, a profligate womanizer like all the Kennedy boys? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so encountering contraception in his daughter's suitcase was... Absolutely. He was familiar with that kind of life. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, he, was, he almost didn't... So he had his most sort of enduring and passionate affair was with Gloria Swanson, uh, the yeah. actress. So when he was making his millions in Hollywood, um, they had a long, long affair, and it, he got very, very close to seeking an annulment... He actually went and said, I want to marry you. He adored that she was a complete sort of 
a passion project. And, you know, one Rolls Royce would, would go with Rose in it and another Rolls Royce would turn up with Gloria. And everybody would know exactly. And, and he would tell Jack and, and, and his brothers, and, and, you know, it was a sort of macho conquest behaviour. And he'd show off about his mistresses. Did um, Rose know? Rose knew. Gloria Swanson said... Um, was she a fool, was she a saint, or was she just a better actress than I was? <laughs> this is a great line. Um, but I, I wrote new, but she just, she, was, she just would never go public on it, obviously. So at one point, Jo um, insisted that Gloria and Rose accompany him to London. Um, and everyone's, well, he's taking his mistress on the, and, and Rose just carried on, and, and he was behaving in a very sort of jealous way of Gloria at the time, and Rose just carried, and that's why she said the famous quote, was she a better actress, she just carried on like nothing was happening, and then she didn't have to face it, so she was brilliant at, at, at doing that, but she knew, she, she did, she knew, you couldn't not know, and I'm absolutely sure that Rose had gonorrhea, which I'm just... John, I'm sure she, I've just looked at her medical records um, in the Kennedy archive, and she's on some pretty, uh, some, some of the stuff she has, I've, got, I've got to speak to Dr. Prentry to really nail it, but I'm pretty sure Rose, uh, Joe gave Rose gonorrhea. And she, she absolutely knew. And, and it was just a joke, and it, that's a famous quote that Jack says, I hope when I'm six, somebody said, oh, your father was chasing the girl around the room. He said, I hope when I'm 60, I'm still chasing girls around rooms, uh, JFK said. But he, the, the boys sort of knew about his philandering. And, you know, he didn't drink, he didn't smoke, he loved women, and he was not going to stop. And, you know, and, and Rose, um, I mean, he, at one point, in front of friends, he said, um, because she wouldn't sleep with him when she was pregnant... Um, so, and he said, this is not in the Catholic faith, Rose. And he shouted that and he said, you are allowed to sleep with your husband while you're pregnant. And if you say this in front of... So he was quite frustrated. Um, and I, you know, I think it was, it was a very strange marriage. And they, I mean, <laughs> they, they, they always, always stayed in separate hotels. So whenever they went to um, New York, she, he would go to, in the Waldorf, she would go to, in the Plaza, and they wouldn't even stay in the same hotel. And all, uh, the, all of the friends just kept saying, this is the weirdest... Just, it's just the weirdest marriage. I mean, they were never going to divorce, but they, they led incredibly separate, you know, separate lives. But it worked for them. That's what my daughter calls a Catholic divorce. A Catholic divorce, yes. Yeah, yeah. But it's a, fa- you know, it's, it's, it's a sort of fascinating uh, um, story. And, uh, and uh, um, yeah, I, I said, and not, I, your point really, and it's a very, very good point, is that it's a hypocrisy of it because, um, you know, at one point... Um, there's a lovely story one of her friends tells, Kick's friends, and she went to call at, at, at the Waldorf for Kick, and she went into the bedroom, she realised it was Joe's, Joe's room, she, she let, she, she, oh gosh, she left her coat, and then one of Joe's friends came in and thought we had a girl in the room with him, but it was Kick's friend, so Joe told this story to Kick and said, oh, he thought I was sleeping with your friend, and Kick thought it was her, but this Catholic girl friend was mortified by this, and she, he was just joking with his own daughter about the women that... He, he landed, and, and so the message, you know, on the one hand, it was Catholicism. You know, uh, Kick says, uh, mother says, don't do the thing priests tell you not to do. I let anybody kiss you. Um, so she was incredibly sort of sexually repressed because her mother's saying fornication is bad and it's wrong and it's this. And then you've got a philandering father who's not hiding the fact that he's philandering. It's sending a very troubled message to this, to this girl. Um, and it seems to me when she met Fitzwilliam. Um, she, he re- she said he was her rep butler. <laughs> she said, I found my rep butler. And he, I think he really did sexually liberate her. Um, and she was absolutely determined she was going to marry him. Um, and, 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 and Rose Rose said if she married Peter, she said she would be completely cut off from the family and she would never see anybody in the family again. She was so, if, if, if everyone thought she was furious enough about Billy, she was even more furious about Peter. And there was no compromise. And that's why, so what Kate was actually doing, she was flying to... Um, France to see her father with 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 Peter and to, to, in order for him to, to to find a way and they were killed and it's a very sad story they went they stopped off um, in Paris and had lunch and they were three hours later a long boozy lunch never have a long boozy lunch when you're about to fly so. and then they got back the pilot said there's a big storm and Peter said oh, don't be so silly come on you, you, you know uh, it'll be fine. And the pilot said, I really don't advise you, you know, we're going to hit the eye of the storm. And, um, you know, they did and cr- crash into a, a mountain. But aeroplanes go above storms, don't they? So this is presumably enjoying take from coming down. Not in those days, no. they wouldn't. Yeah. They? Well, it was a tiny storms, plane. Storms can go as high as 50,000 feet. So, um, 
I don't think planes in those days could right. fly that high. So. And nobody, I mean, at the time, there were no planes were flying because the storm was so bad. And he, it was a, Peter was a very convincing man. So it's just those two passengers. Just the two passengers. And the pilot. And, and his co-pilot. So it's a small plane. Right. Very tiny plane, a little dog plane. It's a small plane. Um, and I said the pilot begged and said, you know. Do not, you know, do not advise. It's a big storm, and and he said, no, 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 persuaded, persuaded. And of course, they lost their uh, he, the son and heir because he was the last Milton. There are no more Lord Milton, so um, very sad. And she died with her shoes off. She always loved kicking her shoes off. And the thing Joe said was when he found her, she was she was just perfect, but she she kept her shoes off. Very sad. <laughs> Sorry, Barbara, don't make me cry again. <laughs> um, I was going to say, um, you mentioned very briefly. Evelyn Moore, sort of, his, his lack of judgment, hmm. which I thought was very, very interesting. We have, we know how central Catholicism came to be in his life, and we know how much he counselled his friends about Catholic matters. Mm-hmm. But if it isn't just in there that you've got sort of the pr- primary Catholic family of America coming to a recent convert for advice. I think that's quite an interesting. Very thing. interesting. Yes. And I was just wondering about how War enacted his faith, and actually, it was the Catholicism that, in his case told him he must not judge. And then again, we have this hypocrisy of the family that are doing, are doing the judging. But and I think he was a very, very good friend to her. Yeah. And, 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 and I'm thinking about Mamie, Mamie Ligon, um, when she lost her faith all those years later, and she wrote to, to, to war. And he says, there is nothing, I, I will pimp for your soul, he said. It's lovely. Uh, <laughs> let me pimp for your soul, um, and I'll arrange for you to see my beast, priest. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, as I say, I, do, I think he, there was nothing he would not do to save the soul of one of his friends. I mean, he really believed that he, you know, that, and he would have been devastated because in his mind, kick would not go to heaven. You know, that, that's what he would think. And that's what he, and he really believed it, but he was still a good friend. He was still a, a, a very good friend. And I think he felt very guilty about her death. I mean, I think he, he clearly he felt responsible. Do any more people from Evelyn Moore's circle, sorry, come into your novel, went to your book, sorry? Yeah, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm very much so, her. very Did much so. Did she know the Ligons, for instance, she was um, Well, uh, she, she, she knew everybody, so in that, the, the pre-war years, sort of 30 to 39, when she came out uh, as a debutante, um, she, she just went to every party, there was a huge uh, party at Blenheim um, for the coming out of, um, Di- uh, what's she called, Diane, Di- who was the, do- um, the daughter, was she... Sarah, Sarah Spencer, mm-hmm. uh, which was Sarah, I think. And it was <coughs> the party just before the war, and it was sort of the party that sort of ended all parties, and Kick was there, and everybody, she knew everybody. She was completely taken up by um, English country, and as was JFK. And, and in fact, Rose said he, he loved, he, he was an Anglophile, JFK, he loved all things English. And, she, and Joe, um, Rose said it was because they went to all these country house parties, you know, and really got taken up in a big way by that, the, the whole aristocratic circle of friends that Evelyn was part of. Um, and they loved the care, they were a breath of fresh air. And it's quite hard to, it's, it's hard to get into those, you know, it, it's, when you're not part, when you're an outsider. But she went to, you know, she went to all the races, she, she did the season, um, and she was completely taken up by this aristocratic set of friends. But then when she came back in the war, um, they, she, they, they just adored her. So she was back in the fold, as it were, and then, of course, she married Billy, and then Billy died, and then she stayed in, so she stayed in London after Billy's death and had this sort of literary salon. It's, it's really rather charming. And George Bernard Shaw and even more, lots of people, you know, would come to, to her house. And so she, she became this complete Anglophile and didn't go back to the States. Just a comment about the genre. You mentioned the, the misgivings that you, that you met with early on about partial lives and some uncertainty about whether that was a workable genre. It, seems, it just seems surprising to me at this point when the partial life seems to be the genre to be working in almost. And I know, but when I wrote my war book, so many people were saying, oh, that's never good, you know, what are you doing? And there's quite a lot of controversy. Well, it seems like it fits, a, it fits perfectly in a way, I mean, because it, it frees you, I mean, it frees you from, from undertaking something like an unreadable Norman Sherry type biography <laughs> and everything. But at the same time, if, if several people take up the same author, it allows for a new kind of expansiveness, you know, if you take up different moments in an author's life and write a whole book. Or a different take, you know. As I, I, I'm just take, very interested different. in friendship and even more because yeah. it just seemed to me that I sort of set up the question: Why, if he was that bad, did everyone love him so? You know, it was, it was almost like a, mm-hmm. why, he was so loved by such a wide segment. He was the most loyal of friends. And going back to Barbara's point, um, and particularly, I'm very moved by his relationship with the Liggins because they were these ones who had it all: wealth, status, the lot. And then they had nothing by the end. And Mamie was living in this grimy little basement flat. And even would send her checks 
I mean, he was really calm. I mean, he, he just, and, 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 and visit her when she was in the bin. She, she had a little time in the bin, and they joked about being in the bin. And he went to visit. I mean, he was such a loyal friend. And so that the sort of, that's the sort of question I asked, well, why was he so loved if he was that bad? Sort of thing. So, almost that sort of, uh, so my take was very much um, friendship really mattered to him. Um, and of course, how could one, you know, compete with, with what Martin and, and Sully did? I would, nobody would want to, but I just thought, well, I've got it. Hopefully, I've got a slightly interesting take, yeah. which is just to say, well, he was very loved. And he had, in, yeah, he had a real sweet gift for friendship, and was very, and very loyal to friends. Yeah, the, uh, you know, Law was tolerant of all kinds of behavior. Uh, it's sort of encapsulated in a diary entry during the war. So Harold, it's not Harold, in, it's, in the, it's blank, but it's Harold Acton. Harold Black back from China and unnatural vice. He describes the Air, Air, Air Force from the point of view of a booger. No, most illuminating. <laughs> and so there was that side was of the world that just, just observed, yeah. as he said later in Tourist in Africa, it's happier, happier people watch birds, I watch men. Yeah, and also female years. friends as well, very important. Cause it's very, I think it's very interesting that letter when he says, I, I did not aspire to your bed, of course. You know, that's uh, in that very early Mitford letter. Right. Uh, but I think women, yeah. women were very, he liked being around women, didn't he? He loved his female friends. Um, and, you know, he could be, <coughs> of course, a rascal that when Dorothy Ligon was late once, he did speak to her for a year. But he, he came back and said sorry. When she said, you know, finally he forgave her. But it, it just seems to me that he, once you were a friend, you were almost a friend for life. Mm. Um, and, and, um, and, and Nancy, uh, to me, that it's just such a beautiful friendship, because, but it's all based on correspondence. It seems like when they were together, they were, it didn't work somehow, but, but those letters are so wonderful, aren't they? I mean, they're wonderful. They are just the most fabulous letters. Um, so that was a sort of correspondence sort of style of friendship. And Diana Manners, he was very, very loyal to Diana Manners, Cooper, um, as was. So again, I'm just thinking about friendship and Catholicism, and it seems to be that he conducted his friendships by the tenets of his faith. So on the one hand, we've got those sort of non-judgmental mm. angle. Mm. And I think he even sort of, is it maybe he had an abortion, and, and he kind of was, you know, still didn't... Well, it's so interesting, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. yeah, so you've got that, and you've also got the loyalty. So the, lo the devotion he showed to his faith is the same as the devotion he showed. But not judging people, I think that was really important that he didn't judge. Yeah. Um, and that letter when Mamie says, I've, I've lost my faith, it's a very tender, it's a beautiful letter, and it says, you know, let, let me help you, you know, the really sort of tender, you know, that's a terrible thing to lose your faith, and I'll, I'm, I'm going to be there for you. Yeah, and it's because I, I want you, I want it for you as well, it's, it's sort of, it is a kind of evangelism, but it's actually very much centred on caring about the person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of course, he almost drove John Benjamin yeah. mad. She did. called him off, didn't she? Yeah. She said, "Stop, she leave him alone. It's mm -hmm. not going to happen." Yeah. But I think when Wall felt he had a chance to intervene, yeah, uh, he, he, he did. Be. And then, if it happened, I mean, his advice was ignored. Yeah. He could live with that. Well, look with with the with the medal when he he hid the medal when uh, Duggan died. You know the deathbed scene that he recreates in Brideshead. And he wrote to Doss, he said, this is a piece of reportage. And the priest gave him a message, just stick it in the room so his friend has died. But if he thought that would save his soul, he said, yeah, yeah, something might happen. And then he hid the medal in the room, didn't he? And then he, did, and he made the sign of the cross. <laughs> so he would do anything to save his friend's soul, and if he thought he genuinely could, could he would do it. I think... Probably. Are we there? Are we there? Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Um, have a great performance.